skeleton of the leg, the tibia and the fibula. The tibia. We're now to take a look at the skeleton of the leg. When we're using term leg or crura in Latin terms, we actually refer to part of the lower limb which is situated between knee and ankle joints. Tibia is the second largest bone within a human skeleton, so second after a femur, and it is one of the typical long bones, so we will see in the following couple of minutes what kind of landmarks we will find and explore on the tibia. It makes sense to start that proximal part of the tibia in the upper left corner of the screen is designed to really make a big contact with condyles of the femur and together with patella to form the knee joint. Inferiorly, tibia will also show some interesting enlargement and as a result of that tibia will be together with fibula and talus forming the ankle joint. Let us start with the proximal tibia first. I want to show the bone as we rotate it 360 degrees in order to get a little bit better idea about its expanded proximal end. Truly, when we describe the tibia, we prefer to say that it is proximally composed of two condyles. This is the medial condyle of the tibia and this is the lateral condyle of the tibia. Condyles are not exactly as what we said earlier for articular surfaces of a femur bearing the same name of medial and lateral condyles. This time it appears that we just have a massive bony enlargement and articular surfaces for knee joint will be seen better when we observe the tibia from the above. This is superior view to tibia. As you can see immediately there are two flattened articular surfaces that are generally known as tibial plateaus. This is the lateral plateau, so this is lateral side of the bone, this is where we expect to have fibula later on, and a bit larger medial plateau to make the contact with medial condyle of a femur. In between condyles there is a slight elevation which is known as the intercondylar eminence. We will see how much of the elevation it is when we change the angle we observe the bone. But while we are here, it makes absolute sense to identify area in front as well as the area behind intercondylar eminence. They are known respectively as the anterior and the posterior intercondylar areas, known as the attachment points on the tibia for anterior cruciate ligament and for the posterior cruciate ligament of the knee. This is the same anterior view to tibia just to point out what is the size and what is the extent of intercondylar eminence. Mechanically speaking, one can consider that intercondylar eminence will fit in the groove between condyles of a femur and by doing that with assistance of course of both cruciate ligaments of the knee, intercondylar eminence might have a role of some kind of guide which will prevent any kind of unwanted movement of a femur in a medial and lateral direction. Naturally, it won't be able to do this on its own as the knee joint is supported by strong collateral ligaments on the both side of the joint as well as with cruciate ligaments in place, such a movement definitely is going to be eliminated even as the slightest possibility. Anteriorly, on the tibia, just inferior to the condyles, we're seeing this massive elevated area which is known as the tibial tuberosity. Tibial tuberosity could be interpreted in two different forms. One is to consider it being attachment for the patellar ligament, a strong bond which exists between apex and inferior part of patella down to this landmark of the tibia, but also some anatomists consider that tibial tuberosity is actually final insertion point for the tendon of quadriceps femoris muscle and within the tendon of quadriceps femoris patella is embedded because it is defined as a sesamoid bone. As we rotate the bone in a clockwise direction, we are now seeing from a lateral perspective the lateral condyle of the tibia and within the posterior lateral aspect there will be a small flat articular surface, facet, that will make a joint with the proximal part of the fibula, better known as the fibular head. 
more on the posterior aspect of a bone. Now we can see again intercondylar eminence. We can see the posterior intercondylar area. And also on the proximal part of the bone, as I just try to show a little bit more of a shaft of the bone, there is obliquely running a landmark, which appears to be quite massive and quite elevated. This landmark is known under two different names. In certain source of information, it is called the solia line, due to attachment of soleus muscle immediately next to it. But also, in some books, it is called a different name, being called the popliteal line, as the popliteus muscle will also attach next to this landmark. However, it will be just superior to it. As we continue rotating the bone, now we are seeing from the lateral direction, medial condyle, multiple openings, again to allow passage for smaller blood vessels into proximal part of the tibia, and then by completing the full revolution of the cycle, we're back to the anterior side where we confirm once again anteriorly located tibial tuberosity. The shaft or body of the tibia. It is quite long and the camera simply cannot capture it, but I'm using this in order to identify what is the easiest form of finding what is anterior posterior as well as whether this bone belongs to the right or left side of the body. That landmark is seen on the inferior aspect of the tibia, a massive projection that will be felt and palpated on the medial side of the ankle, known as the tibial or medial malleolus, is one of the landmarks without which it would be very difficult to identify if a bone is right or left sided, but by seeing it here, knowing it is projecting medially, that means that the bone that we have is coming from the right side. We are looking at the anterior aspect of the bone and perhaps we can easily identify the bony ridge which continues from tibial tuberosity along the shaft of the bone. That is the anterior border or anterior margin of the bone. It is subcutaneous, so it is accessible to palpation and it helps us also differentiate two different surfaces of this bone. Towards this side, we have the lateral tibial surface, the one which is completely covered by anterior compartment of the leg muscles. And this is the medial surface of the bone, which is entirely subcutaneous, and it is palpable practically all the way from condyles along the medial surface down to the medial malleolus of the tibia. As we identify this as the anterior border of the tibia, we will find another quite sharp margin which extends over the lateral surface that is known as the interosseous or lateral border of the bone. Interosseous border serves as the attachment point for the interosseous membrane the one which will regulate quite significantly the relationship between tibia and fibula. This is posterior surface of the bone. Earlier we have identified this landmark as the soleal or popliteal line and practically there is no extra landmarks visible on the rest of the posterior aspect of the bone. Inferior tibia or distal epiphysis of the bone. As it's easy to observe, distally, tibia also shows quite massive enlargement. Not as massive as it was seen proximally, however important enough in order for us to understand what is forming the ankle joint. Distally, tibia expands in a more triangular form, so pretty much making some form of pyramidal structure. And as a result of this enlargement, we're observing on a very inferior aspect of the bone two different articular surfaces that will make the contact with the same bone of a foot. That bone is the talus. There is this articular surface that will make the contact with the top part of the trochlea of the talus. But also we have to consider this massive projection directed inferiorly known as the medial or tibial malleolus. Because this is medial side of the ankle, we then say that 
lateral side or lateral surface of the medial malleolus will have additional facet that will grasp the medial aspect of the talus and together with fibula and its malleolus that will fit in this area we would have leg support for formation of the ankle joint. Inferiorly, now we're looking at the very lateral aspect of the bone and it is a little bit more difficult to observe this indented area as the fibular notch. Please pay attention that we're not referring to it as a facet or any other joint that will hint appearance of synovial joint. All the tibia and fibula join twice. Proximal tibia fibular joint is synovial, but the distal tibia fibular joint, which is assembled in this area, is actually the fibrous type of joint. It makes absolute sense to present it as a fibrous joint and to accept it as is because there is no need for additional movement that will eventually allow separation between tibia and fibula because if it would ever happen, there will be pretty much a great danger placed on the stability of the ankle joint. Ankle joint in general is considered to be the most frequently injured joint within the human body, so why making its life even more difficult?